National Rescue Consultants presents Train to Live podcast with Herb Tyler, Greg Rogers, and Rob Ramirez. Talking all things fire and technical rescue. So pour a drink and enjoy the show. What's up, fellas? What's up, you handsome devils? What is going on, Big Herb? How you doing there, Greg? Hey. All right, Rob, what's going Gene on with your... Uh... Your microphone's off? <laughs> Mine's not off. I remember my first podcast. All right. Well, tonight is going to be one for the books, boys. It's uh, it's, it's definitely going to be a good one. It's... Uh, my phone's been blowing up all day. Hey, make sure you guys are on time. It, it's just been one of those things. It's uh, we have a very special guest on the podcast tonight, so uh, everyone's tuning in to listen to uh, Chief Brian Brush. It's going to be awesome. He's going to be giving us a ton of just great knowledge, and uh, it's all data driven. It's going to be awesome. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Same thing. Super excited. So. We're not going to hold off and, and do all go crazy. So we're going to let uh, Rob take the floor on this one. All right. Before we start the show tonight, uh, I received a phone call this afternoon, and um, we're approaching the three-year anniversary of one of the most uh, historically tragic sh- mass shootings in, you know, South Florida. Uh, three years ago, this Sunday, uh, Valentine's Day, a lot of our local responders, myself included, and uh, a bunch of my good pals. We responded to the Marjorie Stoneman <clears throat> Douglas shooting in Parkland, Florida. And uh, there's a day that goes by that we don't think about, you know, the actions taken that day by the people that were there before us and the members that I responded with. So we'd like to raise a toast in remembrance of the fallen 17 victims, family members, first responders. Here's to you. God bless you. And we'll never forget you guys. Right on. Yeah, it's definitely uh, one of the saddest days uh, in recent times. So without further ado, we're going to let... <clears throat> Can you hear me? Test? Yes, sir. All right. I, I, nothing happened. I don't know why Rob couldn't hear me. Oh, oh we have Greg having audio issues. <laughs> Never. All right. So without further ado, we're going to let Greg introduce our special guest tonight. All right. Um, so I've heard about this guy quite a bit. Uh, he's a pers- co- uh, close friend of a firefighter in my station, and uh, he always talks about him and hypes him up. So his name is Brian Brush. He's a 20-year veteran in the fire service. Uh, his experience includes rural metro-sized apartments. He's the chief of training for the Midwest City, Oklahoma Fire Department, EFO graduate from the NFA, currently completing his master's from OSU. Uh, with a research project on fireground civilian rescue, and that's basically that's basically what we're going to uh, we're going to cover right now. Um, <clears throat> Mayday project, sixteen firefighter life safety initiatives, which all have uh, demonstrated great success in making firefighters safer, and blah blah blah. So I'm going to let him kind of get into a lot of that, and you're going to see uh, why this is so important and is going to be awesome so without further ado there he is hey thank you uh, thanks for having me on tonight guys i'm i'm excited about getting to talk about this i've been typing a lot about it reading a lot about it um and it's fun to fun to discuss it and just kind of hear what the uh what the feel is on the fire service of of, of the information that we've been rolling out right lately that's awesome man it's a uh, i know you're just slammed and, and you're so busy and we appreciate you taking the time out to come on the show and do this with us. No problem, man. So with further ado, let's run into it, chief. We, we want to hear what you have to say. We're, we're going to give you the open platform. We're going to ask you a few questions here and there, but, but this is your thing. This is a, uh, you put in endless amounts of time into this. So we want to hear what you have to say. Well, I mean, I, I kind of want to start off with uh, with just talking about like it's it's not just me. I think a lot of us in the fire service have, have 
got into this to make a difference. And, um, and uh, especially guys like you who, who are spending their off time trying to make a difference in the fire service. I mean, we, we just, we care so deeply about, about mission. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that we, we, we want to know that we're making a difference. And I, when I think back to being at fires and, and senior officers or something telling me, well, you know, there's really nothing you could have done. I, I know their intent is to make me feel better, but that's, it just grows a seed of regret in my stomach, you know, or, or you go to a funeral and, and, uh, you know, it's all, well, there's nothing you could have done. Like I, I, I didn't get into this to, to hear that there's nothing I could have done. I mean, there's, I want to know, um, what we can do and, and what we are doing. So, um, you know, in, in looking back and getting, moving through life in my career from kind of tactical and task level stuff and starting to do a little more research and study on things, um, you know, I, I really kind of wanted to look back on on the fire service and how we've been doing. And, and what's really disappointing is we haven't been keeping track of of the difference we've been making um, other than on, you know, reducing loss. So, um, you know, that's kind of where all this spurred from. You know, we, we talk about wins versus losses, and that's kind of what we're going to cover tonight. But uh, I think it's really important, you know, especially in a time where uh, we're hearing things like defund the police and there's a lot of movements and, and you have to justify your existence. Um, I think we need to change. Did we lose him? Yep. He said he was having some uh, spotty Wi-Fi and all that. So invite him back in. It, yeah, it we, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a show unless we had, unless we had Wi-Fi problems. And he's back. I thought you Irish goodbye. Uh, I guess that's a <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's what uh, Schultz probably told you. I'm, I'm famous for that. But uh, anyway, man, I, I so, you know, that's that's what we're going to talk about tonight is is really um, flipping the narrative. I don't I don't I think I'm I'm freaking tired of, of negative narratives. Um, I want to give people purpose and pride in what they're doing. I want to show them that they're making a difference. And, and uh, you know, I, I will will show you a little bit about, you know, the last 40 years of the fire service, which has been my lifetime. And um and, and I want, I want to do better going forward. My next 40 years in the fire service is going to be positive, uh, setting a big, a big, uh, vision for people and, and letting people know that, uh, that we're going to turn the corner on civilian fire fatalities. Awesome. So chief quick question. Um, I read an article that you wrote, uh, talked about an NFPA study that took place from 1977 to 2017. It shows about a 50% decrease on residential structure fires. And then it also talks about how, uh, the fire deaths today, and I'm paraphrasing, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. The fire deaths today are equal to or just slightly higher than in 1980. And then what you did a great job of in that article, and I commend you for it, was that you compared it to sports and you talked about a football team who, for example, in 1980 was 12 and two, and today in 2021, they're six and one. And you said that, you know, we're losing less just because of the frequency, but our record hasn't improved. Can you elaborate on that some more? Yeah, you know, in, um, I'll kind of before we before we show the slide, it's like, I mean, you guys are the tech rescue guys. So, I mean, you you I think your sphere is high risk, low frequency events. You know, you, you talk a lot about high risk, low frequency in the fire service. In general, we have a good feel for high risk, low frequency, high risk, high frequency, low risk, low frequency and so on and so on. So um, pretty much all we've done with the the structure fires is, is when America Burning came out in the 70s. Um, at that time, there was about a million residential structure fires, a rough estimate. They weren't keeping real good track of their numbers, but there's roughly a, a million structure fires uh, every year, residential structure fires. And uh, we there was 10,000 to 11,000 uh, civilians being killed every year in house fires. And that, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. 11,000 people uh, to fires is, is pretty, pretty significant. So, um, that led to America burning. I mean, that bipartisan support, uh, full political action, uh, funding. Uh, it might have been the last time that like government actually agreed to do something, especially for firefighters. But uh, they turned the corner on it, brought us a lot of great things, and and we were able to make some big changes in the fire service. But um, today, you know, you fast forward from a million structure fires and ten thousand victims to three hundred thousand structure fires and three thousand fire victims, and and all we've done is reduce the frequency. Uh, we haven't made any change in severity. 
Um, what we can tout, unfortunately, is that firefighters are safer than they've ever been. You know, our, our, the, the death, the f f firefighter death rate per fire has gone way down, but, um, our civilian fatality rate has not. So let's, can you guys pull that one up? That first one. So, he, I mean, here's, here's the breakdown, you know, and I, I like to put it at 40 years because it makes it personal. I was born in 1980. Um, and in 1980, the civilian death rate per 1,000 home fires was was right around, you know, seven and a half. Um, you look at today and it's it's closer to eight. Um, it's a little bit disheartening that I've committed my whole life to the fire service on a tactical and a operational level. And um, I was safer as a kid in 1980 if my house had caught on fire, then my, my kids are today in my house. And um, when we like to wave the flag about how heroic uh, we are as firefighters, the only people that should be getting medals in the fire service are prevention. You know, prevention has dropped the, the number of fires uh, significantly. They, they have reduced the number of fires by, by 50% since 1980. Um, so they're stopping the fires from occurring. The event frequency is stopping. But once a fire breaks out, um, we're not really any more successful. The dollar loss per fire is, is way up. Um, the spilling death rate per thousand fires has remained the same. So um, I don't know. It, again, back to the, well, there's nothing you could have done. I mean, I, I'm, I don't want to hear that. I want, I want to do something. And, you know, I, I think it comes down to the, the concept of motivated action. Um, motivated action, purposeful action, planned action. It is all action um, with intent. Um, any action that is done without intent or motivation or purpose is just a response to a stimuli. And I really kind of feel like, man, that's all we've been doing is responding to fires. Um, we, I think, unfortunately, the overall national tone is if we can't prevent it, then it's just going to happen. And the, the result is the result. They died anyway. There's nothing you could have done. Um, and I'm not satisfied that. And I don't think anybody in operation should be. No longer should we be responsive. Um, from here on, we should be purposeful. And, and we really need to, again, flip that negative narrative to a purposeful narrative and, and show people that they can make a difference so they can go all in on making a difference. I love that answer. That is absolutely true. Um, a lot of it, uh, has to do with not knowing where we've been in order to know where we're going. Uh, it, it's so difficult to do, to create motivated action or informed decision making if you don't know where you're coming from. And a lot of the information you're putting out now really shines a light on where the fire service has been, where the gap is, and how we fill that gap. Otherwise, we're just, like you said, we're just responding to fires as a, and responding to a stimulus. And, and, and you know, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. And we all have heard that before. And that's basically what the fire service has been doing for years, you know, you know with, a, with an occasional improvement here and there. But uh, not having this information available to us in the past, I think, has affected our present and where the fire service was going before this. And that's why I place so much value on this information coming out. Um, yeah, I'm very data driven myself. And this is great. Well, and, and, you know, it's like I'm, I'm not going to place blame on the people behind me at all. Like, I mean, they, they didn't have access to information. They like. The, the previous fire service was was very much more at a local level, you know. Um, so like when we look at 40 years, I mean, dude, I've been in the fire service for, for a little over 20 years. I mean, it, it's been my entire life, but it's been half of my professional life. So yeah. um, can you show the next slide, Herbie? Can you slide to that next one? Yes, sir. So, I mean, this one is the is the really personal one. So we look at 40 years, but when we look at the last 10 years, um, that's kind of a throat punch for me. Um, the last 10 years, you know, I promoted to a lieutenant um, at West Metro in 2007. So, you know, I've been in a leadership role for more than 10 years. I've been um, traveling and teaching on the national level for the last 10 years. So um, if you want to measure my contribution to the fire service, again, look at 40 years, but look at the last 10. Man, I mean, this, this has to stop. We can't be looking at fires going down by two and a half percent in our civilian deaths, but growing by 20%, like we, this, something is not adding up. Um, we, we really need to, um, reevaluate everything. Everything has to be back on the table. 
Um, and, and we have to accept that the fire service is changing. We can't look at the past and say, you guys did it wrong. And we can't look at the new generation and say, you guys aren't going to do it right. Um, the shared thing is, is that, that we're both in the present together and, and neither of us previous generation or future generation know what's coming, but to, we're going to, you know, encounter it together. So, um, so, I mean, but at the same time, this is the only data set we've had to go off of. Um, so once again, it looks horrible. You know, I mean, our, our record of performance is miserable right now, <laughs> but we, we don't have anything to balance it at all. Yeah. I mean, are, isn't it insane? And I, I, I don't know if we just, just weren't aware of it or what, but how come we can't say how many people firefighters save every year? I could, I can promise you the American Heart Association can tell you how many people are saved by CPR every year. I can promise you, you know, the Mayo Clinic is going to tell you how many people they put into remission on cancer. Everybody has metrics based on their mission. Our mission in the fire service has been to reduce loss. And that was just set up at a time where all we could hope for is to reduce loss. We weren't interior firefighters. We didn't have thermal imagers. We are professional organizations now. We are going inside to get victims. We better start measuring what our mission is or all we are is loss reduction folks. And uh, I mean, loss reduction in law enforcement is a rental cop, you know, so uh, don't, we don't want to fall under that. We want to start proving that we aren't just reducing loss. We are, we are improving outcomes. So that's, you know, that is the premise of this and, and kind of the foundation. And I'm, I'm setting you guys up with the negative. Um, so that way we can accentuate the positive. But uh, I mean, I'd love to hear, you know, your guys' take on on where we're at. You know, what what drew you to this message? Uh, was it the firefighter rescue survey information initially or has this uh, component of the process started to bring a bigger light to it? I mean, uh, we really need feedback from you guys as to how, how we turn the corner on this paradigm. Well, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll jump in on that. It the um I, I like the rest uh, the firefighter survey it's i i use it on the writ side we just did a writ class so we're kind of like a little um focusing on a lot of the search and all that kind of stuff with the writ side and we get some info that we utilize from there but not to make this political i mean you're a white shirt now so we, you know we're gonna we're gonna mind our we're gonna <laughs> mind what we say very carefully here but how do you or we or everyone how do we share that data with our upper echelon in our whatever department, whatever we're in. So they get the buy-in from the top and they'll actually filter down on the civilian side. Because like you said, you get the new gear, you get this, our firefighters are safer, everything's improving, but our numbers are stagnant. So how do we, how do we as a community get that number to go up or how do, I, I know they can go find the information. H how do we, how do we make that number transparent so we can get the word out better and have it filter down for us? You know, I guess that that's, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, um, it's kind of a two part thing. You know, the firefighter rescue survey, it's been around for five years. It's been organically developed. I mean, talk about by firefighters for firefighters. Like it couldn't be more pure than, than that. It is the, the guys involved with that all the way back to Isaacson and Olson setting it up, uh, Justin McWilliams seeing it through, Nick Ledeen diving into the data, Shane Trent, Lane, all the guys who are who are really into supporting this all in the background. I mean, they they analyze every word of every question to try to get the right information. The the firefighter rescue survey, the the purpose of that is to figure out how the rescues are happening. Um, how we are executing that mission of the removal from the structure to EMS. You know, guys talk about rescue and it, it's not about survival. It's about giving somebody a chance, you know, taking them from a toxic atmosphere to EMS for assessment. If EMS is making an assessment, that person has a chance. So they are all about the rescue. Um, and we've been seeing the numbers climb with the fire provider rescue survey. But again, we, we, we have 100 submissions one year. We have 200 submissions another year. We had 380 submissions last year. We still don't know how much, how many that is in the big picture. We know how much firefighters are contributing, but we don't know how many. So my purpose in this is talk about transparency and numbers is to figure out how many rescues are happening. And then they can report on how those rescues are happening. 
And that's a really important part of like, I'll, I'll nerd out a little bit here, but um, the history of like data collection and research, it's really, it's really been viewed that quantitative data, the numbers are the least subjective. If we just go with the raw numbers, it is, it is very, very simple and, and simple. And it was always viewed that qualitative data like surveys and that type of stuff would have a, a political influence. Um, but if you have mixed methods, if you use the numbers and qualitative data, then you can really kind of have the, the best result. And that's our intent. This is our greatest mission. We need to have the greatest results with combined data. So if I can track down how many are occurring, they can track down how they're coming. Um, then we can blend them together and make a better presentation to the chiefs. And I'll tell you right now what is is what I did to try to make it as close as possible is I use the exact same methods, the exact same terminology that the US, United States Fire Administration is doing to hunt down their civilian fire fatalities. We see people post them all the time. This is how many civilians are killed every year. This right. is how many died this week. Um, yada, yada, yada. I'm mirroring that with rescues. So I'm, t I'm absolutely taking that same method to the rescues. And if a, if a guy who's a training chief at a department working on his master's degree with three kids and four sports can do it, the fire service can do it. So um, that's what we're going to dig into today. So um, part of my part also, like you talked about the white shirt, man, I'll, I'll own it. You know, um, there's enough great firefighters coming along. There's enough great tacticians coming along that, that can backfill maybe what I was doing in the fire service. But I got to keep raising the bar. You know, I'm a training chief at a fire department now, and they are lights out one of the best fire departments I've ever been around. And I need to be the type of chief that is going to continue to to be ahead of those guys and set the right direction for those guys. And, and this is is part of that. So when I find a rescue in the news and I get about 20, 30 emails a day through my Google Arts, I'll, I'll filter through them if it was a cop that brought the person out. I don't I don't cover that if they were Delete. Um, out upon arrival, I don't cover that. I make sure that it, it was a direct action of a firefighter that resulted in this rescue. Then I search down the fire department, their email address. I'll email the deputy chief, the fire chief, the PIO, whoever I can, and say, I know you made a rescue. Would you please report it? Here's the value of the data. And then we, we check to the surveys to see what their response rate is. And right now we're running about um, a 30% response. So it is really, really encouraging and I think because we hit these chiefs at a really proud moment, their their people just saved the life of their community. Of course, they want to report it. I mean, who wouldn't be proud of their guys for 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 hanging it out there and having a positive result? Um, and I I think it's I think it's a special time uh, that we have this opportunity to, to to highlight the great things that firefighters are doing when we're in a society where everything is looked at as what are people doing wrong. That is awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely awesome. Um, Chief, I want to ask you a quick question. Between all of us here, we've all done the training jobs. We've all, you know, d done the teaching. Understand that numbers and data matters. Uh, whenever we try to put a class together, and, and I'm sure you went down this road many times in your travels, uh, you got to go through five, six, seven different platforms to pull data and stats and numbers and find something meaningful to, to, to back or, or, or back up, for lack of better words, your subject matter whatever you're teaching or presenting. If you're put, if you're talking about nozzles or search or writ or water supply, you try to find some, you know, supplemental data to, to back up what you're saying. And every single time we go through this process, you go to three or four or five different platforms, whether it's USFA, NFPA, the Rescue Survey, UL, NIST, Project Mayday, and you try to get all this information. Do you think that we'll ever have a time in our careers, and we're looking at about 80 years of fire service between the four of us here, um, where, where we can go with one stop shop and find everything we need real time, you know, anywhere in the country, the everyday fireman can pull up a screen at a site and know, uh, our wins, our losses and areas of improvement. Is that something you see happening ever? You know, I, yes and no. So, um, you know, I, I get this question a lot and I guess, especially guys are like, well, you know, why doesn't infers do this? And it's like, man. <laughs> Um, I would prefer infers to stay with what they're doing. You know, infers has 40 years of data collection on the things that they're collecting. You know, it's, it's great. Uh, if you want that stuff, there's certainly things that are lacking, but 
I don't want somebody to sit down to do an infers report and then that person have to do a rescue survey, which is a totally different format, totally different. Like I want the, I would prefer to have multiple data sets so I could take them all in, in either compare and contrast um, or the other term is triangulate. If they're saying X, they're saying Y, and they're saying Z, what is the average between the three? What is the commonalities? Um, I think it's really, really important to have multiple sources. I mean, like it, it, it just okay. is. I mean, be it the news media, be it our, our operational guidelines, but spe especially our operational guidelines. You guys know the tragedy of going to truck floor training for all of your training needs. You know the tragedy of going to IFSTA for all of your training needs. Like, we can't do that. We need to have mixed methods, mixed approaches. Um, if I had something to tell you, I would say, man, set up a dashboard for your people. You know, I mean, there, there is the technology right now that the, the screen in your firehouse could be firefighter rescue surveys, U.S. civilian fire data, whatever it does to, to enhance mission. Man, I, I know it's frustrating to go to four sources, but you're the person going to four sources and you're better because of it. Um, okay. We need we need to just we, we need to blend it. So, um, I, yes, I understand the convenience, but convenience comes with the cost, man. It, it just does. So um, I, I, I still believe in, in multiple sources, if that makes sense. Absolutely, it does. Yeah, it makes sense, actually. The way you explained it absolutely makes sense. Can you hear me, Greg? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. All right. You're good. Uh, okay, cool. I'm gonna go ahead and move. I'm gonna go ahead and move on, Chief. I love how you're placing the importance on the need of the fire service to understand not only our losses but also our wins. Um, with this project you're doing through Oklahoma uh, and all the data and gap analysis you've been doing, how does quantifying the who, the how, and the where the wins are being made impact? the future of the fire service. Why are the winds so important? Man, I, I, it changes the whole tone, dude. I mean, like it, it is, um, I mean, we got into this to, again, to make a difference. Like, I mean, it, it is, you want a good city job, there's other ones to do. You know, like mm -hmm. you, 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 wanna, you want a job, even the people who complain, like, going through a 20 week recruit academy and getting yelled at and doing like, that's, that's a process. People have skin in this game, you know, for a reason. Um, the reason why we lose people is not because of them. It's because we, we aren't providing enough purpose. When we have a new guy come in the firehouse and we say, man, you, you're not going to go to the fires like we used to, you're, you, you know, there's nothing you could have done. And like, that is dismissive. Like it, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, it, you don't, you don't play football for the coach to come out and say, man, I, I would just like to lose less this year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who? No. I mean, you come into the locker room and they say, we're going after a national championship. We're going to be lights out. And we're, I mean, we, we want to be undefeated at the end of the year. You guys in and everybody screams, hell yeah, we're in, you know, like we, we are here to, to make a difference. So, um, I think it's critically important, man. I, I think that not just to our people, but to our public, we are coming for you. Um, we, we will be there for you. We make a difference in your life. Um, we have to be positive messengers. We have to be in, you know, whatever you want to say, we need to be aggressive messengers. You know, like, like if, if we don't control our narrative, someone else will, you know, and, and I've seen it happen before in my career in other organizations. I've seen it happen to other disciplines. I've seen it ha like we we have to take charge and take control of our narrative. And I'm not going to get a, too much adrift into this, but the entire country battles cancer. The entire country battles depression. We we will lose a sympathetic ear when when we are portraying us as victims. We exist to reduce the number of victims. And through that, we will get respect and appreciation if we keep our mind on the mission. We don't need to try to make our profession look like victims. Just do work and, and demonstrate our work and it'll be there. So go ahead and show the next one. And I mean, 
let's do it. I mean, as depressing as those last two slides were, look how <laughs> encouraging this one is. You know, like this is the first month, man. This, you know, <laughs> you know, in in 30, so January is 31 and then another six. So in 37 days, we, the fires, I documented 367 rescues. 370 would be 10 a day. You know, I mean, yeah. yes, there was 329 civilian fire fatalities. But if you recognize this, like, here's the other thing to think about is like civilian fire fatalities is it's not all inclusive. A lot of those fatalities were discovered. They were, they were bodies found in fires, you know, like, so um, just because like, it's not a hundred percent, 367 rescues, 329 fatalities. It doesn't mean that that is the ratio, you know, but we, again, we've never been tracking it. 367 rescues and of the responses that we've gotten back, you can see a hundred, we got 106 responses back. That's, that's good for a voluntary system that is only being broadcast through social media and my emails. We can see that the rescues have a 71% survival rate. When a firefighter intervenes in a fire, that civilian has a 70% chance at survival. That's a big deal, man. 260 civilian lives were estimated as saved if we take that 367, 70%. 260 civilian lives potentially saved by the direct action of firefighters in the first month. You know, we never knew that. You know, like, it, and it's like, again, it, it, it's been right there. Why didn't we take advantage of it? So, um, you know, I, 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 it, we've never, we, again, the firefighter rescue survey, it is an amazing tool to demonstrate how and to show the outcome. All I'm doing is showing how many. And I think that that's been what is, what is so amazing. Um, it, 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 it makes me proud every day to see this, you know, like, how the IAFF didn't come up with this idea to say that, that this is how, this is the difference that firefighters make every single day. Um, I don't know, man. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it should be our message. Um, civilian, you know, fire, fire, firefighters, fire departments are rescuing 10 people a day. Wow. Um, well, I think, I think it was almost kind of, like you said, kind of driven on the negative. So everybody kind of just kept flowing with that, you know, like, Hey, this is, this is how we track it. Took somebody like yourself and your, and your crew or your team to kind of break it up. But a question on that was the fatality data. How does it parallel with the other data you were using? Cause that was my deal. Like, okay, you, you were saying 10 a day, but, and you already covered it, but I was just kind of reiterating a little bit of, how many people are actually reporting it? How many are being reported? You know, is it a type of dwelling? Is it a region in the country? And how does that fatality data kind of parallel and go with the research that you're doing? And how do you keep it true? That was kind of, you can't, you answered half of it, but I just kind of wanted to hear what you had to say about that. Well, I mean, that's, that's a little bit tough. You know, I'm, I mean, again, you have to think about the nature of this. Like we we're overall, we're a proud proud profession you know guys will uh, rescue will they'll just say you know that's doing our job um i personally believe that um rescues are underreported um when you talk about region and, and, and you know greg I, I i definitely understand what you're saying like hopefully someday we can get to that you know is it what is going on in this area versus this area that is the whole purpose of data-driven decision making but right now we're just we're just trying to find us a, a starting point a foundation so what I can tell you is, um, you know, we have states, we have in Illinois, we have um, Pennsylvania, we have states that I've, I've been able to, to show have 20 or 30 rescues already this year. But you have California with 38 million people and I've got six documented rescues, you know, so we know that that's not accurate. You know, that we, we, I, you know, we, we, any, any researcher will tell you what is the limitations, you know, like right up front, here is my associations. Here is my, um, my, my funding sources. Here's my support. You got to be completely transparent. And here's the resource limitations. The resource limitations is reporting. Um, you know, there's a lot of departments that, that don't do the press release. There's a lot of rescues that happen overnight in small towns that don't make the, the local news even. 
Um, so um, I can't tell you right now um, what part of the country has more rescues. I can, I can tell you by the numbers I've collected, um, but I can't tell you that, uh, that there is truly a, a regional influence. Maybe with five years of data we could, um, maybe with mandatory reporting, but even infers, infers is voluntary. You know, it may be mandatory at your organization, but nationally it's not, right. you know, um, we can have a lot of rescues in New York. Of course, there's just a lot of people there and they're all multifamily dwellings, you know, but you stretch out to the rest of the country, you're going to find that there's a lot of rescues in suburban dwellings. Um, I, on my monthly report, which we didn't post, you know, I can tell you that for single family dwellings, we're averaging around 1.5 victims per fire that have involved a rescue. Um, at apartment fires, you're closer to two and a half people per fire that involves a rescue. And that's something that I really, you know, it's, um, I, I'm probably rambling here, but um, like one thing that infers could help us with. So you go back to that first slide about civilian fire fatalities per uh, thousand fires and, and, and it's per thousand home fires. Um, but here's what frustrates me, man, is um, there's, there's no checkbox for occupied versus unoccupied in infers. And there should be. After the fire, we know, was that dwelling occupied when we got there or was it not? And, you know, as, as tragic as it sounds that eight people are killed in per every thousand home fires, that's still less than 1%, you know, because in, in, if it was one in a hundred, it would be 1%, but it's not even one in a hundred would be 10 in a thousand. You know, it's the reason why we're reporting it by thousand home fires. So really the danger is pretty low here, but I don't think that that's accurate. I think that what we need to know is what is the civilian death rate per thousand occupied home fires? Because there's a lot of house fires that occur when nobody's home, you know? So if we eliminated it, now we could truly find out what the risk is when people are in the structure and it's on fire. Now, how big of a difference are we making? How risk is, how, how risky is a home fire? Because a home fire with nobody in it, it's just a risk to property. Um, right. But if we, if we know that, you know, there's 3,000, 300,000 home fires a year, but there's only 150,000 occupied dwellings. Well, then we got a civilian home fire problem, you know? So um, that's a little bit of a rant, but. Uh, no, that's uh, you know. that's interesting about the apartments versus home fires. I almost feel like, that's kind of what I was looking for because we were talking about, you know, things that we've done in the past with some survival and writ. And we are kind of focusing on, you know, single story, you know, uh, two story dwellings is kind of what we were going with on our writ stuff. So it was nice to kind of hear that that's how it kind of leans. And there are separate numbers there. So it's yeah, interesting. I mean, it, it, apartment fires have more frequent rescues, but they're higher life hazard, all this stuff. I mean, like, but again, back to data driven decision makings, I understand that chiefs are out there. They don't want to send more people. They want to send the same resources to a house fire as they do an apartment fire. Man, you'll get away with it a thousand times. But the day you show up and people are at balconies, they think the place is going to explode. I mean, there's been reports of people jumping out windows at apartments where it was just burnt toast, you know, smoke in the building, but they get so wound up. It's, it is what it is, man. We, we, we don't control how people see the danger. So, um, I think all that stuff is important, but, and man, I, I mean, God love you guys for doing the writ stuff, but, uh, I think that that's a perfect example. I mean, how come we have firefighter close calls.com? How come we have project mayday and we don't have, civilian fire victim close calls. Exactly. I mean, like it is, I, I am furious that we've been so firefighter centric. Um, we, we need to be citizen first, man. And it, it's, um, but you don't know any better. You come into a system, you're part of that system. It's, this is, we have to change the tone, man, because, um, firefighters don't write the checks for firefighters. The civilians do. And, and if and if they think that we're here to protect our benefits and, and save other firefighters before saving them, they'll they'll figure it out soon enough. So uh, it, we we got to we got to cut it off. Well, a lot so, of parts, a lot of parts in the country, too. The um, the way they do run writ, they should be getting your data because they're just kind of standing out front, leaning on their tool, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
but it's it's none of their faults, man. I know it. I know it. Well, so go ahead, Chief. You uh, you you hit on something uh, <clears throat> earlier, and we we've discussed it numerous times. The fire services safetying themselves out of a job, and we're so worried about the firemen, whether it's clean cab, whether it's cancer this week, or whatever the the ongoing pool subject is that week that takes the fire service by storm. But what you're doing, light never really was shined on it. And now that it is, ha have you felt any negative feedback within uh, within our community? No, I mean, that's, it's, it's tough, dude. I mean, um, think of the timing of this, you know, like I'm, um, you know, the firefighter rescue survey has been out for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, while it's, while we're well aware of it nationally, they're not, you know, like, um, you guys are hyper engaged people, you know, the, the people that are turning in this podcast are very engaged people, but you were, it is such a small sample size of the fire service. Um, so, um, I don't think, and I'm not, you know, I don't think people will even realize or know what I'm doing beyond a, a very small circle for years. Um, or maybe, I mean, who knows, maybe it won't make a difference. Like I, I, uh, um, cause things take a long time I and mean, we didn't get into a safety culture overnight. You know, that was, that was seeds that were said in 1977 because a lot of firefighters were dying and a lot of civilians were dying. And, and again, it's like, I don't fault those people back then for not setting up a rescue survey in 1970. We, we didn't, they had no data, no information, very little reporting. I mean, they, they just had to get their arms around a problem. You know, like you have to stop the active shooter before you can start treating victims, man. I mean, like that's that we just kind of got our arms around the problem. And then, but we are, we have to accept that now we are in a different setting. We, we have much greater access. Uh, we have much better metrics. We have greater technology. Um, the, when you think back to 2005 and the first time there was the legacy versus modern fuels video to today, where we have the UL <laughs> fire study, all these things. I mean, bro, that's, that's 15 years. You know, that's how quick things are developing. We have to be more dynamic. We have to be firefighters in real time. Um, and that is probably the biggest change, regardless of whether you came into the fire service 30 years ago or three days ago, you are in a real time fire service. And, and that is what we need to deliver to people. We can't deliver curriculum that is dated by five to 10 years. We can't deliver data that was set up in the seventies, man. We, it's a paradigm shift. And that's been the catalyst for me truly is 1977 was when all this stuff got into play, but America burning was published in 1973. It is going to make me sick to my stomach if we aren't turning the corner in 2023. And we, we can only say, Hey man, 50 years of the fire service since this, this white paper, this, this seminal document told us what we needed to do. And I read it today and it has the same message. The smoke is toxic. Firefighters need better training. We need to be more aggressive. The only people who took anything from that document is prevention. You know, we, we, we have to stop being so proud and say, man, we got we got 40 years of proof that we haven't been deliberate enough with our actions. We haven't been accountable enough to our outcomes. We haven't been positive enough with our purpose and we haven't demonstrated enough to our citizens. We got to do it different for the next 50 years. And maybe I'll only be a part of it for five. But man, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to the people who go forward to make them better. Cause I don't want my son to be looking back at his fire service career and going, well, shit, dad, you put 40 years in, I put 40 years in. There ain't nothing there. <laughs> yeah. We that definitely don't want that. <laughs> That's absolutely awesome. Chief uh, California. First of all, I've got a bunch of notes. I'm, I'm turning pages and writing notes as you're talking. Uh, California needs to step their game up. They need to report. There's no way to have that little bit of saves and and they're, they're under reporting and, and and that's affecting your numbers so let's get them on on board but it's and it's not just the departments i mean it's 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 the news sources is what i'm grabbing it from you know so yeah. it's just yeah we, yeah we're we not pointing be, fingers at any we agency too, we can't be too proud to report our accomplishments our accomplishments are 
what we exist for, you know, so. Um, quick question, Chief, and I'm um, moving into uh, more quantitative uh, information. Uh, a lot of the, the stuff that you talk about, wins and losses, how impactful they are to where we are as, an org as a fire service and where we're going into the future. Uh, you're a training chief now. Uh, you're assigned to the training division and you, you're, you're impacting at a global level in, in, within your organization. You've been on the circuit for over 10 years, touching firemen from all over the country, you know, border to border and coast to coast. Uh, how do you see the way that you teach, the information that you're putting out, the way you're developing your company officers, your decision makers, how are you going to arm your departmental decision makers with an, an informed capacity to make decisions that are impactful and data driven versus what, you know, what we've all been doing for years, which is, um, you know, effective, but uh, we, we, we're, we're almost like mimicking a skill. We're not fully understanding the why. Um, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, you know we'll 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 get into the data, man. I, and I so um, I just think the negative narrative narrative has to stop, man. I mean, like like that is positive messaging, purposeful messaging, motivated action. Like, I mean, that's that's where you start. You know, we can fine tune all this stuff. I can. I just had a conversation with a chief. Uh, this this morning um out of washington we talked a lot about stuff and we talked about getting into the weeds of of time of day and location and and age and all that stuff and man that's what he was looking for um and 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 we can do that and like that is great you know like on the ems side we change drugs in ems like if you've been in ems for any more than five, 10 years, you've used different drugs, different cardi, uh, cardio version rates, different, all this, it changes all the time. It all changes based on percentage of outcomes. If, if a study can demonstrate a 5% improvement in outcomes by changing a drug, they'll do it. You know, if I can demonstrate in text that a ground ladder rescue or VES has a 70% survival rate versus taking a person through the structure has a 38% survival rate, then absolutely. Man, I understand that you think VES might be more dangerous, but we don't, we're not here for us. We're here to take the survivability rate from 38% to 70%. You know, like it's not convenient to have a two monitors on a cardiac arrest to do the, the double sequential stuff. But you know, you don't have a choice. This gives a patient the best outcome. So driving it that way, but all the way back to the beginning, um, I'm a training chief, you know, I remember coming into the job, dude, you don't know anything, shut your mouth, sit down. You've never been to the fires that I have. You don't have the experience. You never will kid. Um, when we get new firefighters in, we, we throw up some stuff on the board. We, we show them a house fire. I'll ask them, you know, you guys ever been to a house fire before? No, sir. Are you you, you want to go to a fire? Yes, sir. You nervous about going to a fire? Well, yes, sir. Dude, it's just a fire in a house. I know that none of you guys have ever been to a house fire before, but you've been to thousands of house fire, thousands of houses in your life. You've been to your neighbor's house, your friend's house. Like you know the environment. It's 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 just now going to burn. You know, so all that stuff around you is good. I mean, so. I just we we just need to build people up, um, show them they can make a difference, and and that's, I mean, that's that's where we start. So we look at the rescue survey, all the data that they throw out. We look at um, all this information that I've been showing today. But just yesterday, I I put something together and like it moved me emotionally. Um, I don't, I mean, driving training, driving the, the everything, it, it comes down to basically one sentence. So like, you know, this is the, the, the big show. This was what I wanted to bring to you guys and talk about what is going to change the fire service. What is going to change how we approach things? Do you guys believe that complacency is a problem in the fire service? Absolutely. Do you, do you believe that this message that we're going to few fires trends us towards l less vigilance? Do you believe that, that, we are disengaging our people by by making them think that we may only go to one fire, you know, a month here, or we may never have a civilian fire fatality. 
The problem is at the local level, these events aren't frequent enough. You know, the fires have become less frequent. So again, we need to talk collectively. It's no longer my fire department versus this department. The American Fire Service is here for the American people. We need to talk about that. So let's pull up that last slide and we'll just cut to the chase. Awesome. So, man, here it is. I, I mean, the first 40 days, I was going to wait for 500 rescues to, to report on this, but you guys queued me up for the, the thing and we have 40 days. So um, from January 1 all the way through February 6th, uh, and actually that number's or February 9th, which would be 40 days, um, we recorded 410 civilian fire ground rescues um, through my research project. If you take 40 days, you multiply it times 24 hours, it's 960 hours. 410 rescues, and these are legit rescues. Firefighter intervention saved a person or brought a person out of a structure, got them to EMS. This means that every single day, the average is the direct actions of a firefighter rescue a civilian from a residential fire every two hours and 20 minutes. How many times have you heard a civilian dies in a fire every three hours? A civilian dies and this many civilians die every day. I understand that's fearful messaging. That's, that's to pe teach the civilians to be fire safe. But to firefighters, that's depressing. I understand. Tell, tell civilians that so that they put their smoke detectors in. Tell people that so that way they close their doors at night. But we're here to make a difference. How would you feel if you came into the fire service and you were sitting there in your academy and instead of them telling you, man, you're not going to go to fires. We don't make rescues. You know, we're an EMS department that okay, No. Across the United States, every two hours and 20 minutes, a fireman, a firefighter is bringing a civilian out of a structure and transferring them to EMS. And 70% of them survive, more than 70%. So, I mean, how does that do for vigilance? You're sitting in your firehouse, our lecture, our talk right now, from when we logged in, when I got home, to when we tune out tonight, two people have been saved by the direct actions of firefighters in this country. And one of them is going to live, at least one of them. If I mean, that right I, there doesn't I, keep you engaged. If that right there doesn't keep you engaged, then nothing will. You may be the next person that gets tapped on the shoulder in two hours and 20 minutes. Uh, I, I'm going to just echo what you just said. And I'm sorry I cut you off there, Chief. Uh, no, but, go. I but, want you guys to roll. I mean, this is like, yeah. I get excited about this, but I'm just speaking into a into a, a, a Word document. You know, like I want to know yeah. what, how is this moving well, you guys? I mean, does that not well, does that not make you guys goosebump up? I mean, geez. Man. Uh, first and foremost, um, I'm just going to go, go, go ahead and echo what you just said. Um, every two hours and 20 minutes, that's a huge number. Uh, you may be the next guy or girl who gets tapped on the shoulder to make that rescue and be part of the quantitative study. Um, the information we've been getting for years, that preventive uh, mindset where, you know, shut your door to sleep. Uh, a, a civilian dies in a house fire in three hours nationwide. All that builds and builds and builds and either causes complacency because we're never going to get that call or you're going to get the mindset where you're going to disengage and it causes our membership to disengage. You know, the casual member, not your top 20 percent, not your bottom 20 percent, that, that middle, that middle 60 percent that we target um, in, in our in our industry. And, and this numbers like this, they got me at the edge of my seat personally. The information you've been putting out, um, I'm, super, I'm I'm incredibly data driven. The guys on here will vouch for me. Anybody who's ever you know hung out with us understands that everything I do requires a system. And it's something I started a couple of years ago after watching you guys talk and listening to uh, multiple speakers talk, and it started making sense to me. If I have a dollar to invest in training, a proverbial dollar, and I'm gonna invest that dollar in the areas that is gonna cause the most amount of impact in my survivability and my training. So I started looking at the data. How are firefighters being found? How are we stretching? How are we making entry? How are we uh, conducting rescues? And that's what I focused my training on to get the most bang for my buck, for lack of better terms. This information here should have everybody in the country, everybody listening at the edge of their seats, because you may be the guy or girl that gets tapped on the shoulder in two hours and 20 minutes from now to make that rescue. And if you're not ready, that's 100% on you and not your organization. And that's how I feel about it. And I'm just, you know, I'm, 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 I'm psyched. Well, and I also I also feel too that the the way 
the the way you can tell that you were doing your data and the way you talked about it is it's almost with all the listeners, it's almost like an instant mindset change because I was sitting here and I was listening. I was like, how do, how did we not ever bring this up before as a whole when everything that we talk about, everything we do is focused on rescue, especially in a fire. I mean, I, like I said, I sit down and argue with people that search and rescue is the most important thing on the fire ground. Everything else supports it. There's a lot of arguments in that, but, but that's the reason. So with that, do you think, and with your data, and I think it's, um, I think it's like six to eight minutes of uh, rescue time uh, for civilian, uh, not to basically cuts the numbers in half. Do you still think with your data that that falls in that six to eight minute realm? With right, everything, I mean, that- I mean absolutely. I, I I'll still say you know our sample size is pretty small, but over five years it's shown. I mean, like within eight minutes of our arrival, that that's our window of opportunity. And again, back to different data sets, like um, and the importance of it. All this does is it 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 confirms the UL information. You know, the the UL information is dose and duration on 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 everything. Like. Um, the, the, the lightweight building construction is, is, is right there. It's like, we have smaller windows, man. Like we have, it's, I'm sick of the hotter fires. It's not true. The fires aren't hotter. They're faster. So we know fires are faster. They will take down citizens and structures quicker. We need faster firefighters. And by, when I say faster firefighters, it doesn't mean doing things harder you know, it's just like when dispatch can't hear you, you don't just talk louder. It doesn't work. You know, like we need we need faster firefighters in their decision making, in their skill proficiency, in their assignments, in their arrivals. You know, like all this supports a all in 10 minutes, you know, like it does. Uh, back to man, I, I know you like and again, the reason why you guys got so in gauged in writ is because someone demonstrated the value to you. Somebody engaged your emotions and said, this tool can save a firefighter someday because odds are you are not in a fire service where you are seeing civilian rescues every day. You could be in a fire department where you could go your entire career and not make a civilian rescue. You could go and be in a fire department and go an entire career without seeing a civilian for fatality. Um, I've bared witness to both of those and it's has stuck with me. And, um, I, I, I want people to be prepared more for that because the likelihood of you having to save a civilian is way higher than having to save a firefighter. And I want you to not be surprised by that. So we can be quick on our actions because if we're surprised by something, the dominoes fall, towards not being ready, being confused, anticipate rescues. When you're moving down a hallway with a nozzle and you come across a body, we can't drop the nozzle to remove the body because we don't know what to do. We have to get the line ahead of the victim, cool the environment, call for somebody. There has to be somebody outside ready to remove that victim because here's this problem with on paper, your fire attack and primary search. You're searching the path to the fire. If you come across a victim, you have a choice. Do you attack fire or do you rescue? By choosing one or the other, something is getting ignored. I, you know, back to making better with our data decision, maybe on the front end of the fire, we know that there's 10 minutes of potential. If it's an occupied structure, we don't establish RIT until we're 15 minutes in because we need all the resources centric on civilian safety and, uh, and removal and survivability, you know? So, I mean, I don't know what else to say. I've been, I've been in the back of the ambulance doing CPR on somebody without a seatbelt a lot of my life. Um, so I, I've taken risks to try to improve outcomes in, in there. So, but I mean, that's the thing, like, I don't think people know how frequent rescues are happening. I think now that we tell them, I think that in your shift, when you guys come into the shift, if you don't turn a wheel, don't worry about it. 12 civilians were saved in the time that you were in the station from getting there early and checking out your gear to hanging out afterwards and having a cup of coffee with the other person. Your brothers and sisters across the country rescued 12 people. 
It's all right if it didn't happen to you. It happened somewhere and you were on duty, ready to do it yourself. Man, you got you got me uh you got me jacked up on that chief to where I feel like I want to go relieve my guy right after the uh, <laughs> podcast here and get to work. Start spreading the word. That's yeah, that's awesome. that's that great. Awesome. That is great info. That is some of the best info. Um, not to downplay anyone, all the classes I've sat through, but that's probably some of the best info. And like looking forward to, you know, you being on the podcast every year and see where the dad is. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hopefully yeah, I want to, like I said, man, I, at some point I got to cut this off and package it up as a report and do work. I mean, that's, that's the thing is, man, I, I I've committed to three months to this, to, to, to demonstrate the need. Um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm, I own the fact that I'm in a white shirt and I'm at a desk. Um, my heart and soul is in service to, to people and, 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 and changing the vision from to something better. Um, so I'm going to tap out here on, on April 1st, as far as collecting this, but it doesn't mean that it has to stop. I've got the spreadsheet. People are going to be moving through it's Google alerts. We, it, I mean, this can be done by anybody, you know? And I think that that's again, back to messaging, bro. I mean, like, I, I, I don't know why people want to listen to me. I don't know why I've been in this for 10 years. Uh, maybe it's just because I won't quit. Maybe it's because I, I care and it doesn't matter whether people are listening or not. I'm just going to keep working. But um, my message to you and everybody is, man, I, you, you can do whatever you want. Motivated action is, is just that. Like, don't just be responsive. Um, come up with a plan. It will change. My path has certainly changed, but I always follow the path and I always follow my passion and I always find purpose. And, uh, you know, you guys are, are, are fascinated by this, but I do this in, in two hours a day um, between school, between work, between getting to the gym, between playing with my kids. I mean, like uh, anyone can make a difference if they just find a way. Um, I'm sure, I mean, Greg, you got a freaking raker shore behind you. Uh, you probably could have contributed more <laughs> to the fire service by, by looking up Google alerts uh, than building that, taking that nail pattern to heart. And All right, he's out of here. Cut this thing <laughs> off. <laughs> Talking about the yeah. USAR stuff, that's bad yeah, news dude, I, right there. I, man, I, did little for you. I did dive rescue, but those were all just tickets to ride on the, the citywide rig that went to fires. Like it was just, uh, right. it was. Well, it that's was the whole reason. Movement. Exactly. That's the whole reason I got good at it. So I could, you know, ride the squad or the heavy rescue and make sure I was at the fire and then collect your data so you can pass your class. That's kind of what I was doing. Yeah. There. That's absolutely true. You know, the casual fire nerd, you know, Brian Bush is the, the hose water nozzle Elkar brass guy. And in reality, he'd spend most of his time on a rescue company doing tech rescue shit, working on nail patterns and freaking applications. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I knew, I knew there was something glowing about him. Don't let him fool you. The at least it wasn't. A, at least it's not a quint, though. You know, <laughs> one one letter wow. for quint. Quit. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Steve. I'll, I'll, I'll write that down when I go back to work. Thanks. <laughs> That's awesome. It's, uh, uh, so, Kirby, so to, Kirby, what do you got, man? I, I, I'm sitting here, man. I'm, I'm jacked up with all with, with all this. It's. Uh, this is Herbie oh, jacked up, by the way. That right there. That is Herbie yeah. all jacked up right there. <laughs> this is my happy, my sad, everything face. Um, so, Chief, uh, with what you're doing right now, and the info is so valuable, and we all need this info, what is your next plan on to get this out to more of the masses? Do, do, you, do you have a, a focus on how you want to get it out there? Is it grassroots like what you're doing right now and and lead the horse to water and see if, see if they'll drink i mean this information needs to be relayed to everybody in the fire service over and over well i mean it's it's still in its infancy man you know i mean uh i got 40 days of it you know the uh the rescue survey has five years um and again we're we are we're working firefighters too. Um, we got a lot on our plates. I mean, um, I'd love to be able to be a, a Bobby Halton and, and have, you know, a big platform and a magazine and, and everything to, to broadcast this. But um, I'm, I'm, I know that this is a small sample size. I know it's still a work in progress. I know that research can change. I know that we can have 
horrible events that will completely skew these numbers. Um, I'm excited about sharing it as I go, but we, my job is to package it up the right way um, with the support of the university, um, with hopefully some support of some organizations like an IFF or an IFC, you know, taking it up the right channels. It has to be done professionally. Um, it has to be done academically. Uh, so, I mean, that's my work. Um, the, the fire rescue survey information, it's there every day, you know, like, um, I'm, I'm doing my part, bro, but it, it, it is what it is. I mean, I would ask every single one of you to share the firefighter rescue survey. I would ask every single one of here to, to, to forward one of, rather than hitting share on Facebook with the infographic to email fire service wins and losses to your chief, um, to send the, we have a, we have a rescue reporting SOP template on the website um, that you can pull up and just send to your chief. I mean, how often do firefighters ask for policies and procedures? Ask for them. Hey man, when we rescue somebody, let's just make it mandatory that we contribute to this system. Um, you know, I mean, get ahead of it, um, make it public. I mean, that's why we're doing this show. That's why we do everything we can is to get it out there. The citizens need to hear close before you doze and the firefighters need to hear you can make a difference in getting people out of structures, getting them to EMS and getting them definitive care, sino kits, all these things to improve outcomes. We have departments across the country that are sending two engines and an ambulance to cardiac arrest to improve outcomes. And we are not increasing our responses to apartment fires where we can prove that when a rescue does happen, it's going to happen there and there's going to be more than one or two people involved. In it. I got to jump in on that real quick. You, you've mentioned that a couple of times, Chief, and, and I'm not going to go negative. I'm, I'm going to be positive, Rob. But this is the problem. One of the reasons, not a problem, one of the reasons I see a lot of this uh, departments that have uh, an EMS and fire system. I work for one of them. Most of my region does. Everyone transports. Everyone has ambulance at their firehouse. That carry firefighters or respond to the fires and supplement the manpower or augment our abilities or take a functional fire job, whether it's RID or search or they attach to a truck or an engine. That's the South Florida way. Uh, the problem is that there is no accountability ever in my 20 years where if I push the wrong, I'm a paramedic as well. The other two guys above you are paramedics as well, also. If we push the wrong medication, if we give the wrong medication, if we transport the patient to the wrong way when we were all riding ambulances early in our career, then the very next shift, you would have repercussions from every white shirt in the organization, your EMS captain, your EMS division, emails, maybe some type of remedial training, some type of recertification. You can go to fire tomorrow and screw it up 10 ways from freaking Tuesday, and some senior man will come up to a junior guy and tell him, hey, there's nothing we could have done, kid. Everything worked out the way it was supposed to. You could not have saved them. You couldn't have done this or that better. You're not going to get to four white shirts or four emails or any repercussions from that. I'm not saying EMS is the problem. The problem is that we place so much focus um, in the modern fire service with, you know, because there are already all these regulations in place and the studies and they're capturing their matrix, like you said earlier, and they know their numbers. So when we fail to meet their expectations, it comes down on us. But if you show up to a fire and mess it up two ways from Tuesday, Nothing ever happens. You might get a slap in the wrist from your company. You may get retrained if you have a good company officer. But if it doesn't leave the firehouse, no one's going to show up to tell you you guys did a bad job at a fire in most organizations. And that seems to be the problem everywhere I talk to people that, that do a dual service. That's the problem they're having, the, the accountability issue. And um, I don't know how we fix that. I really don't understand how we fix that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you that uh, that won't last. Um, EMS puts puts patients into a, a so we're we're pre hospital. We we take patients from a pre hospital setting and we put them into a hospital setting. There's there's QI QA. There's a, there's a greater there's a, I mean like so let's understand where things go. Things at the fire scene stop at the fire scene unless they're investigated by a state fire marshal or NIOSH or something like that. So. Um, the police, the police report into the federal crime statistics. Um, they arrest people at the local level, which goes to county and federal courts. Um, 
if we think that QI, QA and accountability and accreditation and all these things aren't going to come to the fire service because of the of what we've seen in the past, you're wrong. We, we know it's coming. We, we need to be prepared for it. Um, we need to take control of it. NFPA 1700 has now been published. The, the basically the fire ground operations expectations for the fire service. 1710 is out there. All these national standards and expectations exist. You, you will be held accountable to them if something goes wrong that expands beyond your local level. It ju it's just gonna happen. So be proactive, set high standards for your organizations or just set consistent standards for your organization that are consistent with the federal standards. NFPA 1710, most people know it for staffing and, and response times. It is deeper than that. It talks about manning on hand lines for high rises. It talks about flow rates. Like again, the fire service cliff notes, you read page one or, or page two, or the union read their page and the administration read their page and that's it. Man, be a student in the game and know how deep that document goes so you can support everything you do. My biggest task as a training chief is going deep on everything. So that way I know the depth of it, man. I, 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 why do we do this? Why, why, why? Because, um, because of this matches up with 1710 and 1410 is the training standard for professional organizations to support 1710. And that's why we're doing it. It's not brush thinks this time is good. It is a standard evolution time based on all these different things, you know, like, so, um, I, I don't know, man, Rob, I'm, I'm, I know your experience. I, I think everybody feels that, but you can either bitch about it or you can make a change. So, um, you know, take to your organization and say, hey, chief, I'd like to see greater accountability on the fire ground. Here's the standards that, that can drive that. I'd like to see the stopwatch come out in training. Here's the standard that supports that. But we crave accountability and yet we shun it. So figure it out because it's not about us. It's about them. And I think we all will raise our standards if we have standards. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a great answer. That's, yeah. You, um, you looking for a job down in South Florida? Cause I, I might be able to find you one right up in this general area, man. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I, I work for a, a jam up department. Um, I mean, it is, I'm, I'm so blessed to be where I'm at, dude. It is, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, I got a year to kind of be there and, and get the feel for the place and the operational tempo, the pride, um, man, it, it's, the to, red white and try. it's the red, white and blue collar fire department you want to work for, man. I mean, there, there's, there's people talking about the colony fire department in Texas and it's just because they don't know what Midwest city, Oklahoma has. And, uh, we're going to keep it that way. So. I had, I had to try. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, the, the feedback has just been phenomenal with all everyone sitting in here, chiming in and just the information that you've laid out in a little over an hour. I guarantee you that there is going to be firemen right now sitting there at, as soon as we get off this podcast, they're going to be sitting there and they're just going to start researching. And if we can sit here and, and touch one, two, three, four people, it's going to spread like wildfire. And this is the information that people need to hear. And uh, I, I commend you for everything, man. It's uh, it's, it's truly awesome. Well, again, back to, dude, it, it isn't education or experience. It isn't rural urban. I mean, like, let's be the example to all the other disciplines and everybody else that, that we exist for someone else. It's not teams, you know, like, um, man, I, I'm, I was, I always had the greatest admiration for the academic all Americans, you know, like, I mean, that, that I felt like that level of athlete was, was, was up there. The guy who is a, you know, a top level linebacker and also has a 4.0. I mean, like that's, 
that's what this is all about. I mean, you, I absolutely, I mean, I'm not going to trade in a Halligan for a, a bow tie, you know, um, I, I've spent a lot of time on the drill ground. Um, I recognize that it's time to, to pass that stuff on to other people, but I still get out there, throw the lat. Like, I mean, I, that is a big part of me, but, um, at the same time, man, I, I, I recognize that more of us practitioners can become academics than academics becoming practitioners. And uh, I think that we will storm the castle if we throw more of the practitioners over the academic wall and, and, and we become the, the, the bridge builders and, and, and we make this the right way. There's that famous, famous line, you know, the, uh, the uh, society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its um, thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. I'm over yep. it, man. We've, we've, we've had that for 40 years. I'm over it. You know, I, I want to, I want to have my head full of thought and proactive and moving. And I want the air pack to be on my face, the Halligan turned the right way. Um, and the line charged with, without any thinking. So, um, that's, that's the point of proficiency we need to get because there, there is no time for that not to happen. So raise the bar dudes. I mean, like, let's, let's, let's go get it. Well, I'm definitely going to um uh I'm bought in on your program 100% and I'm definitely uh our our program as you would put it. Uh I I'm definitely going to if I hear anything, I'm going to spread the word and I'm going to work on it as well that if I uh if I hear anything or see something, I'm definitely going to try to pull the data and I'm probably going to work um in our organization and uh and try to look into a couple of the things we talked about and see if we can start pushing that direction. I appreciate that info. Some people don't even, might not even know that. So it's awesome that you brought that up. Robert. Yes, sir. I'm looking at the messages on the board here. It looks awesome. Uh, we have a lot of comments coming in from the audience and the, and, and the people on here are all, like you said, again, the, you know, that top 20%, 10%, the guys that get it, the guys that are all bought in, it's, it's awesome. Uh, it fuels our fire. Chief, I got to commend you as well. You, this information, you've been putting it out now, what, for 40 days, you said? Give or take? Yeah, I've been in the, I've been in the project for 40 days. Again, like, I mean, this is – all I'm tracking is is how many. You know, like the the firefighter rescue survey, they are the they are the true grinders. They are, they are telling us how. You know, you, you, want, the, you want the real – deal and and again that back that back to you know supporting the ul i didn't expand on it a little too much but when we look at the ul studies they can't use humans you know like i mean let's right 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 um, there is a there is a research limitation to ul ul can do their studies on dosage and duration and and victim location um but it's still in the lab look at the firefighter rescue survey Look at the information that they're putting out about survivability behind closed doors, victim location. That when you see the UL information, survivability timelines, location, and you look at the firefighter rescue survey, which is true human data, um, it's it is it is collected from the fire service. Like we all recognize, and maybe that's the message to the chiefs. Like, let's be completely honest. If if we had been collecting research data if we've been collecting rescue data like we have if if the fire fighter rescue survey was in place 20 years ago there would not have been a need for ul to research closed door campaign or any of that stuff we would have been able to tell our own citizens hey you know 80 percent of the time you survive if you're behind a closed door 38 percent of the time we find you in a hallway or a living room you're going to make it. You can improve your survivability potential by 50% by sleeping with your doors closed. And we know that based on the victims we're finding at fires. Millions of dollars went into research using pigskin and, and thank God it did because it started the discussion. Now we can reinforce it with what we're finding in the field. We are the field application of UL research. Um, and and that's, that is the academic all Americans. That is when the warriors and the scholars start working together. Hey, fellas, this is what we found out in the lab. You seen it in the street? Yep. Right on. It's the right thing. Let's 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 do this. You know, enough with this. Ifsta does that, and we do this. And it, it's it's not real time. It's UL and the rescue survey is real time stuff. 
in the last few days, we've had rescue surveys submitted within 24 hours of the incident. And you can find that in the Google spreadsheet on the website. You wanna, you see a news story about a rescue in a town that is similar in your size, that has the same dwellings, go to firefighter rescue survey, click on the data, click on survey two and scroll down to February 1st, 2021, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, scroll over, you'll find out the floor that they were found, the conditions, how many firefighters it took to take them out, whether they used a ground ladder, dirty grab, um, and whether they left the scene alive or deceased. I mean, it's like, how many of you guys watched the burns from UL when they were conducting them in real time? And, and that's, you start yeah, your no. shift. Start your shift and look at the firefighter rescue survey. And I, I, I love that that. Might I love open that. it back up. And if you see seven submissions, you'd be like, dude, it's true. It's happening every day. It's happening every two hours and 20 minutes. Uh, well, for the last uh, the last 40 days, um, I've been intrigued by it. I actually have my phone set and, and notifications on social media, Facebook and, and the other platforms. As soon as something comes up in Firefighter Rescue Survey, I get alerted. And I probably had seven alerts today. So I'm going to go ahead and echo what you're saying to be 100 percent true. Um, as an industry, we're drowning in knowledge and we're starving for wisdom. Right. Uh, that's the, the old saying. And a lot of it has to do with the messenger. I honestly believe wholeheartedly, not because you're on the show, but you're you're the perfect messenger for it. You keep it positive. Uh, you're a validated uh, instructor and guys listen. Like you said earlier, we don't know why they listen to you, but we, but we do. Right. Yeah. You bring a you bring on you bring a, a whole fresh approach to it. Those of us that are that are data driven are eating this shit up. The people that are not data driven are going to get affected by it and should start getting ate up by it. Um, I thank you so, so, so much for doing this. It was long overdue, and I'm glad that you were the person to do it, Chief. You're welcome, man. Thank, thank you for giving me another platform to share it on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Before uh, before we wrap up with you, Chief, um, is there anything that you just want to get off your chest, let it, let it out, uh, take the floor, run with it for a minute or two? I mean, leave, leave these guys something and, and so, so they want more. They Everyone here, I mean, th this is the first time that people are, are hearing this this data. And the fact of the matter is a lot of a lot of guys in the fire service don't know where to get the data. They don't even know the data exists. And is there anything that uh, that you can leave either the younger generation, the older generation, some something just to, to or both. To, yeah, or both. And, and so they go back to their firehouse and, and, and they have something to think about. Man, I, I you know, uh, the, the, the concentration is is obviously the data. You know, that's what we're talking about. But um, some of it doesn't exist yet. You know, again, this is its infancy. Um, uh, just just I, I mean, have purpose and, and, and give people purpose. Um, I mean, like, I'd, I'd love to tell you about data, but like, like, um, if you don't, if you don't care about what you're doing, you're not going to go research anything. You know, if, if you don't feel like you're making a difference, you're not going to give a shit about the tools. Um, everybody that everybody in life has a potential to make a difference, man. And, um, so so every day, you know, find purpose in yourself and, and try to provide purpose to somebody else, um, because that's what's going to lead to that motivated action. And I mean, that is what we need. We, we need to just stop being a response to stimuli um, profession. We need to have motivated action, purposeful action, planned action, because all that can be evaluated. When we fail in a response to a stimuli situation, there's nothing to evaluate. You just did we just reacted, you know, we, if we are purposeful, we're motivated, we're, we're, we're planned, something doesn't go right, we can look at it. This research, if it doesn't go, like, I mean, it's, this is just the beginning. I'm, I'm just a master's student. I haven't had a true academic look through this, you know, like, I mean, we, we can go in a, in a lot of different directions. This is just the start of something, but, um, man, I mean, not just, just know that you make a difference. Know that, that, uh, 
you you may be working with a guy who's never had a rescue, but 10 times a day it's happening and that dart can land in, in your yard anytime. So whether you research the survey, whether you, you take another rep at the door prop, whether you, you stretch dry from the, the, the rig to the, to the bunk room, everything makes a difference. You know, I, when we look back to um, the, the quote on, on Hugh, the original Hugh Halligan, it's basically comes down to, man, it, it, um, anything that you do with purpose is in the service of, 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 of God and someone else. And uh, um, I think that's, that's important. That's, uh, that's huge. Um, <clears throat> so, Greg, you got anything for Chief for before he signs off? No, I, I just want to thank you for coming on and um, sharing the the data. Like you said, it seems like yeah, it's only forty days, but I mean, this is this is game changing stuff right here, big time. And uh, I thank you for for continuing what you're doing. And um, I know I could probably speak for the other guys, but I I'd like to have you back on six months, mm -hmm. eight months, whatever, to find out just to see where we're at, you know, just to see what kind of changes are going on and, uh, and go from there and then argue about it or high five or, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, and if they listen to you again, then somebody's listening to us, you know? So. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I think, I think we recognize that the close before your dose campaign is, is a big deal. You know, I, I think that that's going to save a lot of lives. Um, what I would challenge people right now is, uh, man, prevention has made a difference. You know, prevention has reduced the frequency of fires. Prevention messaging works. Don't look at the prevention guys in your department as, as, as anything other than making a major contribution to the fire service, uh, because they do. Um, I will tell you that we will, we will never be able to evaluate the impact of the close before you dose campaign. If we don't report these rescues right now, only 25% of our victims are found behind closed doors, but they have an 80% survival rate. If 10 years from now, we see that 70% of victims are found behind closed doors, we may not be able to prove it, but there's a pretty good correlation that 10 years of messaging to the public on closing your door at night has taken a number from 25% to 75%. We've done that with smoke detectors. We, we have smoke detector campaigns. We, did they have a fire? Yeah. Did the smoke detector go off? We've evaluated that. That's a piece of equipment. What we need to do, like close before your doze is a life-saving intervention, like escape routes. We're not telling people escape routes anymore because the, the, the places where they're getting killed is trying to run through the chimneys of these fires and the open arteries. We're telling them to shelter in place, compartmentalize, reduce the duration and the dose of the toxic gases. So if we want to make a difference in the fire service, maybe we won't rescue anybody, but we can at least gift the close before you dose campaign 10 years of good data to show what they're doing is making a difference that, that people are hearing this and there are more people behind closed doors today because of what they're doing. It, 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 it demonstrates value. It is coming to us. The fire service will be questioned on our value. We got a bump in our stock because of 9-11. Um, but any day we could be faced with the defund the fire service and, and we need to be ahead of it. What are you guys doing to help us? What are you guys doing to save us? Um, well, uh, we go to fewer fires. Oh, really? <laughs> That'll get you more money. Yeah, that's um, not the answer. No, no. Right? <laughs> what I can tell you is that American firefighters – are saving a civilian from a residential fire on average of every two hours and 20 minutes. One city council meeting, every city council meeting that occurs around the country in that time period, a firefighter is saving a life. That's heavy. Awesome. I appreciate that. Well, that, uh, that, uh, close before your dose only works when we hold up our end of the deal and go in yeah. after them and get them out of the structure. So uh, us as a fire service, we have to keep our end of the deal. But that's a conversation for a total other day. We're not going to yeah. go down that road with you, Chief. Yeah, no, it's fine, man. I, I'll, I'll buzz off. I'll get the white shirt out of the room, and you guys can keep rocking. You can <laughs> you can crack your second ones, and, you know, maybe maybe we can get Herbie to smile a little bit bigger. Hey, hey, <laughs> listen, Chief. 
Indeed. That's his happy face, Chief. He's the angry one there. in the group. All right, fellas. Well, I think I'm going to shut down, but I mean, I'll I'll probably keep watching. I'm just going to go say hey to the kids and and uh, and get ready to 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 kick ass in the office tomorrow. Make sure you know. shut their door tonight. Yeah, I always do. Buddy. <laughs> All right, Chief. Thank hey, you so Chief, much. Thank, it was an honor, thank brother. you once again, man. Honestly, thank you so much. It was an thank honor. You, brother. Thank you, Chief. We'll be in touch. That was awesome, boys. What a good talk. Yeah. I, I usually I usually jot a few notes down here and there. Um, I got a page and a half of stuff, and some of this stuff is so horrible. My writing, I, I got to revamp it just because of the fact that it. Uh, I'm trying to look at the camera and write, and it's going all over the paper, so I got to revamp my game a little over here. I need to learn shorthand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, I literally shit. have uh, – this, this, this was the first uh, podcast that all of us did not refill a drink. It was uh, – I have literally a page and a half of notes. And it, it was just awesome, man. It was a. Uh, I have my you know, I have my cooler right down here. I got I got three beers <laughs> left, so I don't know how much longer I can go here. Well, coffee. <laughs> so, that that was huge. Uh, and for all you guys listening, man, take that information back to your fire station. Listen and give that information out to everybody that's willing to listen to you. And if they're not willing to listen to you, throw it down their throat and make them understand how important that that is. Because I can assure you that all of us on this uh, on the screen right here, when we came in, that data was not given to us. That data wasn't given a year ago. That is data that is needed. And if it didn't give you goosebumps when he's sitting there telling you, then you need to reevaluate yourself in this fire career. And, and that's the reality of it. Dude, that was so high speed. Listen, uh, first and foremost, again, I'm going to thank Chief Brush for coming on. Uh, he's, he's a gentleman and legit a scholar. Like, I know it's, it's cliche, but the guy meets every freaking thing. Um, it's so difficult to do what he does and put that information out there and, and have a buy have buy in from the audience. If anyone follows him on social media, if anybody uh, follows Firefighter Rescue Survey, these things are coming out every single day. And um, the information he's putting out is ridiculously useful for our fire service. I'm a firm believer that, you know, if we don't have data, we don't, we can't create systems. If you do not have a system in place for every thing that you do in the fire service with a primary way of doing that, a, a, a contingent way, an emergent way of, of whether it's packaging a down fireman, getting your SCBA on, masking up, uh, throwing a ground ladder, you need to create systems. And what better way to create systems than with up-to-date data? So you know what the common denominators are, where we're failing, and now with his data, where we're winning. Um, these, these, this data is going to create better systems, and those systems are going to drive our performance. They're going to increase our efficiency in the fire ground. They're going to increase our survivability. Um, I'm jacked up about it. He was, he was pulling at my heart, heartstrings. You guys know that I'm a data nerd uh, when it comes to firefighter survival and rescue. So again, thanks to him. And thanks for, to you guys for bringing them on because uh, that was a home run, Herb. That was a home run, Greg. Uh, well, <clears throat> um, so I like to sit here and bang my chest on it, but I definitely have to give a shout out to uh, my fireman Ben Schultz because he. Never I feel like him. I. I feel yeah. He's he's just a fireman, you know what I mean? But uh, he basically, I felt like I knew Brian Brush because he came from the same department as him, and he always talked about things that he did and a lot of it was engine stuff, which I just kind of, you know, started yawning and looking the other direction, not my jam. But when he gets into things like that and the way he's a forward thinking and, and, and he just kind of looks outside the box, that's the kind of stuff I like. Cause I feel that the three of us, we kind of feel that way as well, whether it's tech rescue or, or anything that we're doing. Um, we try to think outside the box. We try to be logical, um, Try to keep it positive, believe it or not, even though everyone says I'm the angry one, but we try to keep it positive and we try to teach, learn, make it longer if we can, you know, so everybody gets it on the same page. And he's the epitome of that. And the, and the, I took tons of things out of it, but the one thing I really liked tomorrow morning at, at, uh, at the, uh, kitchen table morning meeting, I'm pulling up fire, uh, rescue survey. And I'm just going to say, all right, let's look at the number now and we'll check it again later on. I'll check it again later on that night and we'll go from there and we'll, we'll see, we'll see where it's at. It's a, yeah, it's a great, justify. it's a great opener. If that, 
if that doesn't set up exactly if that doesn't set up the plate for you doesn't set the table for you to to roll into some form of training uh, uh you know seat assignments expectations at both ends to two hours and 20 minutes that's a ridiculous number two hours yeah. and 20 minutes we're getting shit done someone's gonna go to their next birthday their next their kid's wedding someone's gonna get married if they haven't been married yet some kid's gonna grow up and go to school because every two hours and 20 minutes the men and women of this fire service are impacting someone's life in a positive manner we're saving fucking lives and that matters man if that doesn't set the table for all you got out there why to train why to be why getting your gear on on time matters why masking up matters why throwing ground ladders matters dude if this shit does not get you hyped up uh, like like herb said and go go find an orange apron and go work at a store where they sell fucking tools because this is not the job for you man exactly well and let's yeah. let, let's think about let's think about that too um the uh, the certain certain things of um it's going to make you drive a little bit more and then i think as us in the south here i mean he's in oklahoma but us in the south if, if we get wind of it i mean we know we have a pretty big community that we run in so when we get wind of something maybe we should reach out and kind of press those guys we know to get the info and we'll send it up in their name you know Absolutely. but it'd be cool to see where this is in about six months and then two years five years just to see you know how crazy it took off um so it's gonna be fun it's gonna be cool to watch yeah it is uh, a hammer I'm, I'm excited for it so before we wrap up man <clears throat> i just want to touch on a few things uh bears the oath they're doing uh, their conference number two in georgia march 11th through the 14th if you guys haven't signed up definitely go to it live fire there's a bunch of uh guest uh instructors that are going to be out there NRC is going to be out there doing their uh, written survival program. Uh, you got Build Your Culture with Sean Duffy and Pablo. You got the Fast uh, Board going to be out there. You got Jason uh, Liska, the can man. He's doing the leadership. There's a, I know I'm forgetting a bunch, so I apologize, but invest in yourself. Go to some of these conferences. There's, there's a bunch of uh, conferences that have been canceled or postponed. Uh, if you have the opportunity to go train, go train. Be part of the brotherhood. Do the fellowship. It, it, invest in yourself, man. Uh, anybody that's been around me long enough knows I use that phrase all the time. Invest in yourself. You have to do that. So definitely, definitely, definitely look into it. If it's uh, possible for you to make it, we'd love to see you out there. Um, the next thing I want to uh, touch on is we did a man versus machine class last week. Uh, Timmy oh, Gleason. Right. Timmy Gleason was uh, the lead instructor. Rob, uh, Rob Ramirez, and Chris Duda were out there, and it was a home run. the The class was phenomenal. It was just a a great, great class, and the students got so much hands on. The evaluations that came back from it were awesome. Uh, Rob, Rob can definitely tell you more about the class than I can. Um, it, it was just a home run all the way around. The class with the home run, the uh, the, instru the lead instructor for the class, again, uh, one of our NRC guys, Timothy Gleason, uh, he's been r running around this area for a very long time. This He's been in this man versus machine, uh, heavy machinery rescue, uh, industrial machinery, re machinery rescue arena for the better part of 15 years, you know, traveling all over the country, involved in FDIC, worked in other groups up in the Northeast. And he, you know, he brought the class down to the South Florida region for the first time in in my career that we actually have a class of this sort in the area and the students that attended it it was a home run um the class itself is, is, is a must do for every firefighter it's not a uh, special operations class it's not a truck company class not an engine company class it's, it's a hybrid class of everything we carry on all three of those rigs and you're just learning how to use them for those low frequency high risk calls in precarious positions so you can get to use all types of tools to cut separate and defeat every type of machinery you can imagine from basic rings to i said rings to uh, to piercings to heavy machinery and we have a, a, a special component of it that covers the fema uh protester defeating uh protester devices and we understand all the stuff that's going on politically around the country today and again uh, timmy gleason does an amazing job that picture in the far right there where he's laying down with his arm in a pvc that's one of our protester devices and amongst a bunch of other props that we bring in and timmy actually goes into detail where every student every single student in the class 
got to get multiple reps and multiple cuts and multiple attempts at defeating all these uh, devices and equipment and tools and assembly, disassembly. Dude, I, 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 I had a blast teaching it. Uh, I learned more than I taught. And I'm not just saying that. I really mean it. So if anybody on here can get out there, schedule a class, uh, please do so. You will not regret it. If you have not taken this class over a three-day period, I know some guys have gone to fire conferences and paid for a one-day version of it. If you haven't done it in its entirety over a three-day period, um, you're, you're missing something in your hard drive that you, you're going to need at some point. So sign up for it. All right. So we're, we're going to keep this one short tonight, man. It's uh, it's going to be hard to follow up with the uh, after uh, Chief Brush left. So as always, we want to thank our sponsors, uh, Breachpoint USAR, Miko Fire Brotherhood, uh, for all your equipment needs. First do screen printing, Bears of the Oath, the Cam Man, and Nozzleman Leather Company. Uh, I know I tell you guys every time on this podcast, all three of us that are on the screen, we all rock uh, Nozzleman Leather. And all of NRC's gear is uh, printed by First do screen printing. Miko takes care of us. Um, Go to uh, Breach Point USAR for uh, your technical rescue forms. It is just a brotherhood, and we appreciate you guys uh, believing in us and tuning in every time we do a podcast. So with that being said, I thank you guys, and until uh, we see you at the next one. See you. Thank you.